vintage radios and the like have lethal voltage, so only personnel with the proper training should make or attempt such repairs. If you elect to follow any of the practices and procedures described here, you are doing so at your own risk and under your full responsibility. If you do not know what you are doing, do not attempt any of the following practices and procedures. In 1939 this radio was meant to be a cheap, small and portable model, in a Bakelite case. This is the way in which it appears from an advert in the January 1939 edition of Radio Retailing Magazine. However, this radio must have fallen off to the ground, destroying the case, which has been replaced with a very personalized wooden one. In particular, the front panel appears made of smaller wood pieces glued together and the rear panel made with an old M antenna, which, however, was not used as the antenna input of the radio was connected, instead, to the mains, via a decoupling capacitor. The dial face of the wooden reconstruction was taken from a Firestone Air Chief model, which was misleading in the beginning, because, looking for that brand and name, it was impossible to find the right schematic for this radio. The radio has a terrible smell, caused by the mold that covers everything inside the case. Luckily, the loudspeaker seems to be still intact, and no major component seems to have suffered from that. Only the first intermediate frequency transformer shows the sign of the accident that occurred to the radio, as it is bent towards the variable capacitor. The vacuum tubes are then removed and the process of analysis and restoration begins. The original radio configuration includes three wire-wound resistors. In this schematic reproduction, the first one, R2, is hidden inside and all along the power cord. The second one, R3, is used to regulate the current of the filaments in case of failure of the dial light bulb. The third one, R4, is used to regulate the bias for the control grid of the final amplifier. Considering that this type of resistor, built in this particular way, would very likely operate as a current regulator, changing it with normal fixed-value resistors would require putting slightly higher values. Like all regular superheterodyne radios, also this one has two intermediate frequency transformers. The first one appears on top of the chassis, with the usual shield, but the second one is hidden under the chassis, and it is not shielded. The first intermediate frequency transformer had been bent by the accident that ruined the original case, and accessing the internal coils requires straightening the shield first. Before removing it, however, the connections must be labeled, because there is no other point of reference available otherwise. After the most delicate components are removed, it is now time for cleaning. As mentioned before, every surface in the radio is covered in mold, but under the mold there is also some type of dense grease that was feeding that mold. The only option that seems reasonable is to start washing all what is possible in the dishwasher. After the first wash, the mold is gone, but a lot of greasy stuff remains. With the help of a toothbrush and some Vaseline oil, some manual cleaning proceeds where possible. Then, another washing cycle in the dishwasher, to remove the last grease residues seems to be appropriate. In the end, the variable capacitor is protected with oil and the coils are covered with new wax. It is now time for rebuilding the radio. The process starts from the first intermediate frequency transformer. It is necessary to use wires with different colors, to be able to identify each one of them. The rest of the radio is slowly rebuilt following a modified schematic. In the new schematic, in particular, the following should be noticed. After the power switch, two fuses control the filament line and the B plus line, already before the rectifier tube. The purpose is to put the lowest value possible, 
to reduce the chance of damages due to overvoltage or to internal short circuits, typically in the filter capacitor. Also a varistor is added to control the line that feeds the filaments. The varistor is calculated only for the AC power supply. The wire wound resistor, originally hidden in the power cord, is replaced by a powerful resistor attached to the chassis to dissipate heat. That resistor is calculated to allow the radio to function up to 128 volts, without damaging the filaments. However, in normal conditions, that would have the effect of making the radio work to a slightly less power. The antenna can no longer be connected to the mains, as that would only bring useless noise. Like in any other superheterodyne radio, the intermediate frequency transformers must be tuned to the proper frequency. For this particular model, the frequency is 465 kHz. But before turning on the radio, special care must be taken to avoid damaging the equipment and hurting personally, possibly with deadly consequences. The radio chassis is directly connected to the mains unless it is used after an insulation transformer. The modulated signal should be applied at the antenna input, taking care of decoupling it. Also the ground connection should be decoupled properly. The intensity of the signal should be read in parallel to the loudspeaker input. Using a completely insulated plastic screwdriver, the two variable capacitors accessible on top of the first IF transformer should be tuned for maximum tone level, and the same is for the single variable capacitor connected to the second IF transformer, accessible from the top of the chassis. Warning! The screw of the last variable capacitor, the one related to the second IF transformer, is hot. If a regular screwdriver is used for tuning it, that would put the B-plus in short circuit to the chassis, with sure bad consequences for the coil, possibly the rectifier tube and the operator, that could be electrocuted even if the radio is connected to an insulation transformer. This radio does not have a suitable dial face anymore, therefore the dial frequency alignment is just useless and should not be done. Only the antenna trimmer capacitor could be set for maximum signal at 1600 kHz. Also the wooden case requires some attention. First the mold is removed from the case as well, cleaning the wood outside and inside. The parts that were glued together, that now are detached, are cleaned and re-glued. Finally, some red oil is used to brighten up the color. The back cover is also replaced with something that could allow some better airflow. nazionale nel senso che stiamo parlando di guerra di liberazione e in questo senso la festa di Hanukkah è rimasta in gnoil in sredsta usa varstvo rastlin the radio works but just turning on any sort of switching power supply seriously compromises the reception This ticking sound is made by just a single phone charger.
This is made instead by a few LED light bulbs. The radio works, but it was not intended to function in today's environment. This radio project is fully documented and available from these links, also appearing in the enclosed description.